All right, folks, I want to welcome everybody to this video where I talk about how I got back to the Philippines uh, during the quarantine. I'm just going to tell you my story and what I had to do, what documents I had to come up with, um, everything from A to Z. Today is Sunday, August 30th. I got back here the 28th, so I wanted to make this video while everything's kind of fresh in my mind. If you're looking for some type of action in this video, this scenery is not going to change. This is a talking head video, me sitting here talking uh, to you out there. You know, if you're um, if you have a wife over here in the Philippines or children, I'm going to tell you how I got back, and I'm going to go through all the little fine details. Uh, this is not going to be action packed, and it's going to be talking technical stuff as far as documents and links and all that stuff. So if you're um, if this don't apply to you, then just pick the next video. There. Uh, a couple housekeeping things if you're not a subscriber. Over there. Right there in that little corner. Click that overstay road sign. Click the bell. I don't have a production schedule. So if you subscribe, then you know when I throw out some, some great travel videos. Or cooking shows. Okay, so let's, let's jump right into it. Um, I've written a detailed blog post. I'll put the link down in the description where all these links and everything is going to be housed on my website. And you know, to stay on track, I am going to sort of read from this. You know, use it as a as a template. Okay, yeah. So I'm back in the Philippines after two months being in the U.S., taking a little road trip, a little road tour, seeing some family, handling some business. Um, I left out, I think it was back it was June 20th, somewhere in there. I think that was it. I don't have my calendar pulled up, but you know, a lot of you said when I left that hey man, if you leave, you're not gonna be able to come back for six months, a year, two years. And at the time when you guys were telling me that, that could very much have very well been the case. I had mixed emotions about leaving. I didn't want to leave. I did not want to really take that risk of not being able to, able to see my babies or uh, you know the ladies for for that long but again I you know I didn't go just uh, for vacation I, I had things to do I had to I had to roll the dice I had to take that risk and I just in my mind once I get things done over there um, I'll make it back somehow and you know, one of the purposes of me going is, and I'll talk about this in another video, you know, I had a, a job opportunity that I had to explore. And it was something I couldn't pass up. I had to, it was 50-50, there was no guarantees. I had to go check it, check on it, which I did. And had it went through, well, I'd have been working over there for a while. Uh, listen, I would have been working, not necessarily there, but I would have been working. So my situation, I had to roll. So I roll with the knowledge that maybe I can't get back because at the time there was no mechanism in place for me to get back. Once I left, that was it. No mechanism to come back at that time. So the first order of business, how did I get out of the Philippines? Because I know a lot of you guys are here. You've been here during the whole time. And you have the question, well, you know, how do you get out of the Philippines? Because initially during these lockdowns, there were people stranded on islands all around here. And it was no different in Thailand and other places around the globe where you had, you know, people on, on vacation. The lockdown hit and they got stuck wherever they were at. Um, so, you know, I'm sure some, some of you, 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 you know, you, you've been riding this thing out. So how did I get out of here? Well, um, I, my scheme of maneuver, I booked a, a flight on Etihad. Etihad had a flight once a week at that time, leaving Manila to Chicago. You know, it went Manila, Abu Dhabi, and Abu Dhabi to Chicago. I highly recommend this flight for many reasons, whether a lockdown is going on or not, because when you go to Abu Dhabi, you go through CBP, what they call pre-clearance. It's basically uh, Customs and Border Protection Facility at Abu Dhabi Airport. <clears throat> so imagine you fly from Manila to Abu Dhabi and during that layover, you clear customs, you clear immigration. 
Welcome back to America. So when you fly from Abu Dhabi to Chicago and you get off the plane in Chicago, there's no, there's no standing in lines, there's no clearing immigration, customs, or none of that. It's like you got off of a domestic flight. You just get off the plane, get your luggage, and go. It's perfect. Um, what, what a great concept versus flying into LAX and having to stand in line. So whether there's a lockdown or not, you know, if you can hit one of these places around the globe that have that pre-clearance, when you get to your final destination, you're just saving time. So that's what I did. I booked that flight. I had to go to my local Barong guy here and say, hey, I, I need a travel. I just knew it was a travel letter. I need a travel letter because, you know, here we have to have a quarantine pass to leave the house. I said, I need a travel letter to leave. They charged me, I think, 50 or 100 pesos, one or two bucks, whatever it was, and they gave me the certificate. And it had nothing to do with my health. It just basically said, um, I have no outstanding criminal cases in the Brown guy. All right, so I got that. And they said, you got to go up to Subic Town and get another travel pass from the police up there so you can pass all the checkpoints and get to Manila. So I went up there, a lot of OFWs up there, and I basically filled out a small form. They took my temperature, they wrote the temperature down on there, and the form basically said, we didn't do a COVID test, but the guy you know, says he's uh, in good health and his, this is his temperature. All right, so that was a you know, quick process. And I emailed the embassy and they emailed me back a form letter. It basically says, hey, let the US citizen pass because he's trying to exit the country. It's just a form letter. Um, no big deal. So I had all this stuff together and when I went down to Manila, I'd heard different stories. Um, you know, during this whole thing, flights have gotten canceled repeatedly. You know, people get down there, they go to their flight, the flight is canceled. Come back the next day, the same thing. So I had no idea what I was getting into. I booked a room the night before. When you get to the room, well at that time, uh, you're basically stuck in the room. You know, you're stuck in the room, they bring you your meals, you can't leave the room, you go straight from that room to the airport. So that's what I did. I spent the night, and the next day I went to the airport. It was sort of a you know, little bit longer check-in process, standing in line, no big deal. I made it through there, flew to Abu Dhabi, cleared uh, CBP there, and flew to Chicago. Wonderful flight. From Abu Dhabi to uh, Chicago, you're on a 787 Dreamliner. Wow, great aircraft, great flight. So boom, I'm in America, right? Um, so there was no COVID test for me to get on that flight and exit the country. Because I, I get these questions free, frequently. Did you, did you have to take a test before you get on the flight? No, I did not take a COVID test. All I did was go up to Subic and they took my temperature and I got that little pass, which nobody asked for that. Let me back up. When my buddy Dawn picked me up and we rolled from here in Subic to Manila, we just breezed through the checkpoints. Nobody asked for any of that paperwork, but I had it just in case. And I recommend whatever they're telling you to get right now, you, you certainly don't want to get hung up at a checkpoint when you're trying to get to the airport. That doesn't make any sense. Uh, but I, know I was never asked for any of that paperwork during my check-in process or, or nothing. Okay, so after rolling around America for two months, handling my business, and the, uh, the job did not materialize, okay, it's time to get back here to the penthouse suite with the ladies and my babies. What can I do? And at that point, it was kind of a low point because I wasn't sure. I didn't know what I didn't know. I'm just assuming there's no way I can get back, but I'm also staying optimistic. Now, in, in my travels, okay, so the first thing I did, I went to Philippine Airlines website. Now, I always fly Cebu Pacific because they're cheap, they get you there, but their technology and their know-how and everything is not on the level of Philippine Airlines. That's my personal experience. You know, Cebu Pacific will get you there. They're usually late, it's cheap, it's no frills, but if you have extra money, I always recommend you fly Philippine Airlines. Much better experience. 
but it's more money. So I get to Philippine Airlines website and I think that they have the most up-to-date information. The link to that is down in the description, down in the, the, the blog post. They have a section that tells you everything you need before the flight, who can fly. It's updated on a regular basis. That was my roadmap to getting back here, to following everything I had to do. It's not perfect, but they are putting effort into it. They are updating it every few days. And that's That was my roadmap. Um, but the first thing I did, okay, and I, might, I may be getting out of order here. Well, let me let me just get let me get back on track here. All right, so I checked their site. I read up on the site, and during during my reading and stuff, I come across the Interagency Task Force for Infectious Disease. It's resolution number sixty. They passed this on. I think it was July thirtieth, and what they did they ch they changed the paragraph because it, uh, prior to them changing this. Um, you know, you, you couldn't come back, but they changed this paragraph to where it says foreign spouses, minor children, including children with special needs, regardless of age, of Filipino nationals, as well as foreign parents of minor Filipino nationals, okay, including children with special needs, regardless of age, provided they secure or possess the appropriate, appropriate visas. All right, so what, what does that mean? Because when you start talking legalese, it's interpreted various ways. The, air, the airlines may interpret it different ways. Immigration may interpret it in different ways. But as I read it, okay, I'm a foreign parent of a minor Filipino national. Boom, right there, okay? So if you're married to a Filipina, you are a foreign spouse. Um, if... Uh, your minor children of a Filipino national, okay, that would cover you, cover you. And if you're a foreign parent and your child is special needs and say he's 28 years old, you still qualify as I read this. Now let me throw my disclaimer out there. Number one, this information is subject to change and may have already changed by the time you listen to my voice. Number two, I'm not a immigration attorney number three I'm not with immigration number four I'm not an expert on this I'm just telling you my experience how I interpreted this as I went so I said okay resolution number 60 applies to me all right and just luckily I had all Forrest G's uh, a birth certificate and all his paperwork because I've been waiting for the embassy to open up on some other issues so I had his paperwork with me I uh, had everything, a whole packet of his stuff. I said, okay, all right, so what? what's next? Secure the appropriate visas. Does that mean that you secure the visa upon arrival like you normally do? And that I just have to show up in Manila, the immigration guy is gonna say, let me see your child's birth certificate? Have no idea. But in my experience, it all comes down to whether or not the airline in the country that you're leaving from. It's whether or not that airline allows you to get on the flight. Now, yes, that logic is flawed because if you don't have your stuff together, the airline lets you fly and you get to where you're going, immigration can very easily not allow you entry into the country and, and tell the airline he's not admitted and it's the airline's responsibility to get you back to uh, your home country. Now, they're going to do it at your expense, but if you don't have the money, the burden is on the airline because they allowed you to get on that flight. Different places do different things, but, but the point is, you can get on a flight and get to a country and then get denied entry. But in my experience, my hurdles have always been the airline has a stricter level of uh, a stricter burden to get on the flight than I have experienced with immigration when I get there. You know, they'll say, oh, well, you have to have this, you have to have this. And when you get to the to the country and you, you try to show that information to immigration, they don't want it, they don't care. So there's always a disconnect. But I like to roll the dice and say, hey, 
My hurdle is to get my ass on that flight, put my ass in the seat, let me go to the country that I'm going to, and I can reason with immigration. I would rather get there and roll the dice of reasoning with immigration, showing them additional documents, uh, explaining my story to that immigration officer, because ultimately it's the discretion of that immigration officer whether he or she allows you entry into their country. And if they have a question, they're going to go to their supervisor and the big boss on shift is going to come out and, and weigh in on it and make the decision whether you're coming in or not. But for me, I would rather do business with immigration because they're the ultimate uh, gatekeeper versus the airline agent back in the country that I'm leaving from, if that makes sense. So here's what I did. I called. I wanted the number to the check-in counter at LAX. I want to talk to somebody who is the initial gatekeeper that's either going to check me in or tell me, no, you don't have the appropriate documents to board the flight. That is my gatekeeper. So after I, I Googled you know, the, the numbers and everything, I got a couple bad numbers. I finally found the number. Um, and the, the, well, I finally got the number from a Philippine Airlines employee and they said, hey, look, you, get, you need to call after 530. They're only there between like 530 and 1030. So I made the assumption that there was only one flight a day. Turns out that's, that's correct. So after 530 that night, I call and I said, hey, look, this is the information I'm looking for. If I get on flight PR103 from LAX to Manila, what do I need? The guy said, absolutely, you have to have a visa. He said, that if you don't have a visa, that, that's it. The, the burden is on you to obtain the visa from the Philippine government prior to you showing up here trying to get on the flight. I said, thank you very much. That's what I need to know. Are there any more requirements? The guy said, look, right now, it's a visa. I said, okay. That is straight from the horse's mouth because the guy is sitting there actively every day checking people in. He has the most late, latest up-to-date info because he's there, he's doing the job. So with that, I said, all right, gotta get my visa. Um, and, the guy, and the guy said, hey, it doesn't matter if you show up uh, and show your kid's birth certificate or all that, it, it, that's fine, but no visa, you ain't getting on the flight, okay. So how do I get a visa during this uh, this pandemic? So the first thing I did was I was get on I got on the embassy's website, Philippine Embassy in the states. Um, if you have experience with a lot of these other uh, other countries' websites and their embassy websites, they're very rudimentary. They don't work. The information is dated. Um, so I had to do a little digging around, but I found an email email the Philippine Embassy in Washington DC and I said hey what are the procedures during this uh, this pandemic and the lockdowns and the quarantines you know what are the procedures for me to obtain a visa in accordance with resolution number 60 you know I am a uh, foreign parent of a Filipino minor child um, so they sent me an email back and said sir you need to contact your local consulate I'm like, all right. Now, now, folks, remember, the, you know, everything, embassies are shut down. They're not issuing visas. So the normal process, you know, may or may, or may not apply. So they're telling me, hey, you got to go to the consulate. I'm thinking, all right, that's because of, you know, of what's going on. So I emailed the consulate in Atlanta and I CC'd Washington, D.C. Now, I recommend you do that because during this stuff, information is changing. Sometimes you may get routed to uh, the wrong person. They give you incorrect information. So I CC DC. Well, the next email I get back is from the actual VC unit in DC with an email providing me with everything that I needed to do to obtain that visa. And in the blog post down there, I copied and pasted the email so you can see exactly what they emailed me. And then later on, I got an uh, email from the M or from the consulate in Atlanta. I said, you know, sir, you have to uh, obtain your visa from DC. We don't issue visas. All right, so just a little bit of disconnect. Not mad at anybody. Things are, things are shut down. There's you no know, skeleton crew. I tell you the story. Just, you know, one, exercise some patience. Number two, make sure you follow up that you're getting the accurate information. 
Okay, so begin the email. They said, all right, if you, uh, and it's kind of mixed in with spouse, child. All right, so a copy of your marriage certificate, a copy of your child's birth certificate. Okay, so I had his birth certificate with me. Okay, proof that, uh, you know, your child is a, uh, is a citizen. An example, well, that says spouse. Okay, a copy of the Philippine passport for the child or school ID. So I had a copy of Force G's passport. No problem. It was in my packet. Letter from your wife stating that she is currently residing in the Philippines at a specific address and that she is expecting your visit. Or, you know, the same with the child, that um, she's expecting you to visit the child. The letter must be notarized by a local notary public. All right, so came up with complication number one because you know, she's sort of locked down here. You know, the FedEx place over at the SM wasn't open when I left. I don't even know where a damn notary is. So she'd have to, you know, get on board the try, go find a notary, write this thing out, then go try to find FedEx. Then I'm waiting. I'm like, that's a that's a little roadblock. Not impossible, but it but it's a roadblock. Okay, actual passport of the applicant. So you physically have to put your passport and send it to DC with this packet. Um, photocopy of the data page and it's got to be six months valid. You know, typical tr um, uh, visa requirements. All right, the non-immigrant visa application form printed legibly and notarized. Okay, all right, no big deal. I print that out, fill that out, take it over to the, to the uh, UPS store. They do notary stuff there. Uh, no, no problem. Travel itinerary. All right, just on all these visas, you know, it never makes any sense that you have to buy your flight, print the itinerary when you don't even know if you're getting approved for the visa. But that's what you got to do. So, I actually found a sale flight on Philippine Airlines, and folks, it was like 850 round trip. Round trip, LA to Manila, Manila back, 850 all in. It was on sale. The stars aligned for me that particular day. Boom, pull the trigger on it. Because what I had done was just to check that Etihad flight to see how much the flight was from Chicago to Abu Dhabi back to Manila. It was 4,500 bucks. That was kind of scary because I'm like, holy shit, you know, do they know something that I don't? Are these flights really going to shut down? There's, that's crazy. It's a crazy price for a one way flight. So, you know, I went immediately to Philippine Airlines, 850 round trip, snatched it up while it was on sale. Okay, send a colored photo, two by two, and proof of financial capacity, which is a photocopy of your bank statement, um, and an employee certificate indicating your position and salary or affidavit of support. You have to send some type of financial report, uh, uh, support, supporting documents. This is nothing new if you've ever t uh, obtained a visa before. Send them like the past, uh, I sent them either the past month or maybe I sent two months bank statement. I think that's what I did. Two months bank statement. Um, let's see. I sent two different credit card statements showing, you know, showing your uh, your credit limits. They that's always worked for me before too. And just wrote a letter and said, "Hey, this is what I do." Signed it. So you need to send some type of financial documents, and that's just that has nothing to do with the the, the lockdown. That's just typical when you're going to get a visa, right? And a self-addressed prepaid envelope back to uh, your place. They don't accept FedEx. So don't send the, send the, I mean, I guess you can send it up there maybe at FedEx. I didn't, I sent it UPS, but you can't have a prepaid FedEx em envelope in there for some reason. They don't mail FedEx. Go with UPS, it did me right. Matter of fact, the UPS store during this process is your friend. They can print all this stuff out. They can take photos for, uh, you know your your two by two photo and they can notarize stuff and they can ship stuff just go to the ups store 
Okay, the visa fee, non-refundable, pay payable in cash or money money order, made payable to the embassy of the Philippines. Personal checks and credit cards are not accepted, so don't put a check in there. They're not going to take a check, cash or money order. Okay, now when I mail this, I'm at the UPS store, going through my packet, making sure I have everything, and I've got a hundred dollar bill clipped to it. Now, when the UPS employee sees this, she says, sir, it's against UPS policy for you to ship cash. And I'm like, God, here we go. I said, okay, I'll be right back. Walk over, wait till the US employee, UPS employee is not looking, and I clip the $100 bill in my passport, clip it back, boom, send the cash. In violation of UPS's fucking no cash policy. Okay, but I'm just telling you, don't stand there and do it because they'll tell you the same thing. Maybe they'll give you some shit about it. Just clip it in the passport, paper clip that $100 bill in the passport next to your bio page, they will find it. The fees, single entry, valid for three months is 30 bucks. Six months, multiple entry is $60. And multiple entry for 12 months is $90. Now listen, I recommend no matter how long you plan on coming here for, even if it's just two weeks to visit your family, spend the 90 bucks, get the multiple entry valid for 12 months. Why? Because say you come here, you know, at Christmas time and you spend two weeks, uh, well, hey, you're already good to go. If they, as long as they don't change the rules, you can come back in the summer and spend a month or whatever. You don't have to go through this process again. And if they do shut this process down and say they're not issuing any new visas, you already have that visa valid for 12 bucks. So don't be a cheap bastard, all right? If you got uh, kids here or you got a spouse here, spend the 90, get the multiple entry for 12 months. Now, that visa is valid for 59 days when you check in. So if you're planning on spending a year, you know, after 59 days, I still have to go to immigration and, uh, and renew that. And I was thinking, hey, it's like a bullet buying on it. It's not. It's, uh, I can't remember the type. I don't have it in front of me. Uh, but I got the multiple entry, valid for 12 months, stamped in for 59 days, $90. Now you're going to send that to the visa section, all this packet to the visa section, Embassy of the Philippines, 1600 Massachusetts Avenue, Northwest, Washington, D.C., 20036. Again, all this info is down in the blog post. I'm basically reading off of this. Okay, incomplete documents may result in denial of visa, and that's the email. So what I did, I put all this stuff together. Um, I went to the U UPS store, as I said. Now, the only thing I didn't have was the notarized letter from Fatima because it was damn near impossible for her to go get it. Now, not impossible, but very difficult. I said, you know what, just in the essence of time, I'm gonna shoot this stuff up there and hopefully that they will be understanding and some type of logic would apply. Now, I know that's going out on a limb because it could easily just say, it's not complete, deny it, send it back, keep my 90 bucks. But you know what? I was remaining optimistic. I didn't have that letter saying that I was coming to visit her, notarized, but shot out. Boom, it's on the way. Dropped it at the UPS store. And the, uh, I think that was Monday. Packaged out up there 9 a.m. Wednesday. Okay. A short while later, I got a text from the embassy that said they had received my visa application. I was like, holy shit, all right, somebody's up there on the ball. Somebody has received it, They're, they've opened it up, they've got my number, they sent me a text, boom. Simple technology is working, the system is working. So I was excited, you know, and a big shout out to the folks up there uh, in DC working at the Philippines embassy. You guys are great. It was a absolute pleasant experience um, you know uh, going through this process you guys are on time so then after this text which you know gave me a warm and fuzzy that hey everything is good to go nothing's lost in the mail somebody's on the job I get a nice email that's saying you know sir 
uh, we've received everything, but your package is missing the notarized letter, which I expected. And this is what I was hoping that would happen, that, that they would work with me, that they would acknowledge that it wasn't there. What are my, maybe there's some other options. This is exactly what happened. This is the way you hope government, governments uh, treat you. And that's why I, I am 100% satisfied with how they treated me during this. And they said, hey, look, um, we need a notarized letter because you have to prove that your son is physically present in the Philippines or that your wife is physically present in the Philippines. All right, that makes sense because if your wife and kids are in, living in California and you're just using them as an excuse to get a visa, okay, they've stopped that loophole. So part of the requirement is for you to prove that, that they're actually in the Philippines. All right, got it. Underst understand it. And what they said was, if we understand that maybe she can't send the notarized letter, so all, alternatively, she can send a photo with the child that shows a current local newspaper, but the date has to be clearly visible. I said, that is no problem. It's much easier for Fatima to go run down a newspaper and take a picture with Forrest G than it is for her to go this notarized route and go to, go to FedEx. I was like, you know, I am, I am, uh, everything was going my way. So it was a reasonable request. I thanked them. I said, I will send you the photo first thing in the morning. So I waited till the old lady woke up. I said, look, go get a local newspaper. And so she saddles up, goes around with the, when the Lamborghini and can't find a local newspaper. You know, the local newspaper delivery does not deliver like they used to. She went to all these little stores. Nobody's got a damn newspaper. So I'm just kind of laughing, you know. They said, hey, the newspaper delivery stopped months ago during the lockdowns. So she ended up over in Barrio Barreto somewhere, and she finally found a newspaper. And I'm not saying there's not newspapers around. I'm just telling you my experience. So she gets back with this newspaper. Now... Folks, Forrest G is an active, active child. And he's strong as an ox. So between her and Faye trying to hold this dude down to take a photo, and he wasn't that morning for whatever reason, he was not in the photo taking mood. You know, because they're sending me video. We had the video going while they're taking. He, he won't sit still. She's trying to hold this newspaper. They'd take a picture. It's blurry as hell. You couldn't see the date. That was the hardest part of it. I mean, it was funny as hell. It took him like an hour to finally send me a photo of Forrest G with his face, her face, and a, the newspaper date legible. And they finally got it done, but it, it was funny. He just did not want to cooperate. I sent it up to the embassy, and they sent me an uh, email, said they received it. And so I sat back and waited. So, uh, I think that was Thursday. Maybe that was Thursday. Because it got there Wednesday. They said they had it. Yeah, so it was, I guess it was Thursday. It was Thursday by the time I sent it up there. And on Friday at like 2 p.m., I think what it was, is when they handed it back to UPS. And I really appreciated that because, you know, most government employees that work for any government, we call them Federal Fridays. Most people on Friday, they quit work at noon, one, two. Federal Friday, most government workers are out of there, especially in an embassy type situation. Yeah, you go, you go to an embassy after 2 p.m. on Friday and try to get somebody to help you. But like 2, 3 p.m. on that Friday, boom, they dropped it off the UPS. It was on the way back. I had it in my hot little hands on Monday morning. Boom. All that was in there was my passport with the visa, you know, a sticker in the passport and a receipt. So again, shout out to everybody working at the Philippine Embassy in Washington, D.C. You guys are on the J-O-B, um, applying logic, understanding the lockdowns, understanding the hardships that people are going through to try to put these packets together. I certainly appreciate you guys up there. Man, from the text message to the email to working with me to... I can't say thank you enough. But that's what, that's what you have to do, folks. 
that's the process to get the visa and as of the day that I flew from my situation no visa you're not getting on the flight okay once you get the visa you're not done okay check daily the Philippine Airlines uh, page links in the description it's updated regularly it has all the information that you need to know to get your ass on that flight and get to Manila okay so I'm gonna talk about the information that was current as of the time when I flew I arrived I flew out on the 26th of August and I arrived on the 28th of August at 3 50 in the morning by the time you listen to my voice this possibly probably may have probably changed okay how can I say that uh, that many times? But basically it says, okay, there's four conditions of the interagency task force on uh, expo emerging infectious diseases. Must have a valid visa at the time of entry. Number two, you have to have a pre-booked accredited quarantine facility. There is a list of hotels that are approved for you to stay at in Manila or Cebu, wherever you fly into, in this case, LAX to Manila. You have to choose a hotel off the list of approved facilities by the Bureau of Quarantine. Again, those links are on that Philippine page. Book you a room for two days, at least two days. That's what they are requiring. You're going to stay in that hotel for one to two days while you await the results of your COVID test when you get to Manila. Well, folks, it's starting to come on soon. I hope this doesn't mess up the audio. All right, let me, let me take just a quick pause, close this up. I, I think that might be a little loud. Hold on. Okay, hope that's better. Um, you, have to, you have to book a room for two days. Now, if you do it on a GoTo, at least when I did it, they had free cancellation like right up until the night before. What I initially did is I just booked two nights at the Red Planet Makati. It's on the approved list. It was 20 US dollars a night on a Goda, and I could cancel it at any time up until like the day before. You know, if you're not familiar, uh, most of the hotels and airlines are giving free cancellation or free rebooking. They're waiving those rebooking fees. Maybe not after September 1. Uh, but anyhow, I recommend you book on a Goda. Now, this is, this is how I gamed it. I booked on a GoTo to uh, just have it ready. But as I got to where I knew I was going to fly, I wanted a higher level hotel. And I'm going to talk about that later. But, you know, if you're on a strict budget, I recommend the Red Planet Makati, 20 bucks a night. Um, problem solved. Print that out. You're going to have to show people that hotel booking when you get to Manila. All right, it's a requirement. Okay, number three, with a pre-booked COVID-19 testing provider. Now, this was confusing because I didn't know if I had to Google one and find a test and go. To... No, this is done at the airport. It's mandatory. If you are an OFW, I believe that it's free for you through the Red Cross. They pick up the bill. If you are a gringo like me, 4,500 pesos that you're going to pay the minute you get off the flight in Manila. First stop. First stop is to pay for the test. Literally. Uh, 4,500 pesos. But what you have to do is click that link in, num in that number three section. You're going to fill out a form. It's the RT-PCR, you know, the COVID-19 form, what have you. Once you fill that out, you're going to receive an email. That email is going to give you a number about that damn long and a link to another form. You're going to click that link. It takes you to that form. You're going to take that number and plug it in there. Fill out that form. Then they're going to email you a uh, QR code. You know, it's one of them square codes, you know, looks, uh, you know, where the cell phones can read it. So when you get that QR code, um, you're good to go on the COVID testing part. 
you have signed up for the COVID test. The COVID test is right there when you get off the flight. So it's kind of misleading when it says a COVID-19 pre-booked testing provider. No. <laughs> uh, they, set, they set the provider and they set how you sign up for it. Now make a note. You have to fill this out within three days of your scheduled departure. So I'm trying to do my due diligence and get this done ahead of time. It, it will reject you. You have to do it within three days. My flight was on Wednesday. I did it on Monday. I got my QR code. But I tried to do it uh, before. It didn't work. So three days. If your flight's Wednesday, you know, do it on Monday. Simple. That QR code, make sure you print it out where you have a printed copy, because they can scan the printed copy, and make sure you have it readily available on your cell phone. Now, why do I say do both? Because if, if you get off the plane and you have it ready, it's just a quick scan, boom, now you're off to the races. If your phone goes dead, you can pull out that piece of paper and they can scan the paper. Don't be cheap about it, do both. Okay. Number four is subject to the maximum capacity of inbound passengers set by the, uh, the task force. Uh, because they're going to put, if you read down into it, they're going to put you know, returning OFWs and Filipino citizens ahead of you. So if the flight is capped at 50, 60 percent, uh, I don't know how they do that. But basically, number four, don't worry about that. As long as you get on the flight, number four is pretty much a given, right? Now, it says after checking in online or at the at a ticket counter, you're supposed to fill out this additional form. That form does not work. It doesn't work. The technology is not working. It does not email you a code. And when you get on the plane, you're going to fill out a stack of documents about that thick anyhow, which pretty much I, I assume covers this. And when you check in, they're going to hand you this form that says, okay, you've got to fill this out now, and then after check-in, you fill out this form. That's the form that don't work, people. Unless they fixed it, uh, it didn't work for me. It's, uh, the technology is jacked up, so don't even worry about filling that one out unless they say they got it fixed. It doesn't work. Okay, so I've got everything together. I got that QR code, I got my hotel printed out, I got my visa, um, I've got all these supporting documents that I sent to the embassy, I've got a copy of those because all these supporting documents that you send to the embassy, they're going to take that. The only thing you get back in that UPS package is your passport and a receipt. Make sure that you have copies of all those documents you sent up to DC. The bank statements, the kid's birth certificate, all that stuff. You need to have those supporting documents because immigration can ask you for that. Even print out the picture of you know, your spouse or the child holding that. Because once you send it up there, the embassy keeps it. Make sure you have uh, two packets. One packet, you know, one thing of copies that you take with you. All right, check-in counters for flight PR-103. They open at 5.20 p.m. at LAX. And if you're not familiar with LAX, like if you say, if you look at your itinerary and it says, what terminal are you leaving out of? Some will be blank because the system can only put in numbers or letters, right? But on one form, it said TBIT. And I'm like, I thought it meant to be determined. Well, no, it's Tom Bradley International Terminal. So if you see TBIT, it's the International Terminal. The taxis know where to go, but if, but what the what, what you'll you know when you get in the cab, if you're not familiar with LAX, you're, you know they'll say what terminal. Well, you're looking, and there's nothing on there, and you say, well, I'm going Philippine Airlines. Oh, that's the Tom Bradley Terminal. And you're like, what the fuck is that? Okay, Tom Bradley International Terminal TBIT and you're on flight PR-103. Check-in counters open at 5.20 p.m. That's about five hours ahead of the flight. When I looked at the board, most of those international flights, they're opening between five and six hours ahead of time. When I went, there was only a handful of flights going out. That terminal is like a ghost town. Um, 
if you knew 100% that everything was in order, there's no reason to get there five hours early. Whatever the mandatory thing, they say four hours, whatever, you'll be fine. I got there early. I was, me and this other uh, American dude were the first and second guys standing in line because we were in the same situation. We thought we had all of our documents together, but we didn't know. So we wanted to get there early, find out early if we needed to show them anything else, you know, pull up some more information. Um, so we were there. He had been there since 9 in the morning. I was there since 1.30. And shout out to you, buddy. I don't remember your name, man, because we got separated once we started getting everything checked in. But uh, shout out to you. My check-in was smooth. Opened up the... The passport, found the visa, said, sir, I'll be right back. I have to scan in the visa. Yes, ma'am. Came back. Everything was good to go. That's all she asked me for. I had my big stack of papers ready to go. Didn't ask for any of that. Didn't need to see the QR code about the COVID testing. Didn't ask for the hotel. Could they? Of course they can. And maybe the policy has changed now. Have the fucking packet ready, people. Have all that stuff ready to go. But I'm telling you my personal experience. I rolled out, I breezed through security. When I get to the flight, then they start making announcements that you have to wear a face mask and a face shield. Now, nobody anywhere said that it's mandatory that you wear a face shield on the flight. I knew that in the Philippines, yes, when you get on public transportation, you have to have a face shield. My small brain should have said, well, fool, you got to have one on the flight. But I didn't think about it. All I had in my bag was that redneck hat with the Ziploc bag. It is a barrier. It's not pretty. Yeah, it says Ziploc, but it, it accomplishes the same objective as a hard plastic face shield. Anyhow, I had that as a backup. But yes you do have to wear a mask and a face shield during that entire flight. Do not show up there without a face shield. Stop by Walmart, stop by Dollar General, get you the biggest face shield they, they sell. Because what happened, when I got on the flight, the flight attendant come up and handed me a face shield. Thank you very much. The problem was, it would like fit for his jean. It was tiny, it was for, you know, a tiny face and I got this big melon head at that point I had 10 pounds of hair with that pompadour I put that thing on and it was so tight on my face it was about to make me sick it was too claustrophobic it was it was worse than wearing a gas mask it was just so up against my face it was a it was a child size I couldn't wear it I mean it I basically had to hide out during the, the entire flight because the thing was making me sick luckily the minute I got off the flight there was a medical personnel there who handed me another face mask and it's big. It's got a big foam thing out here where, where the, like the first one had a thin foam headband, right? So it's right on my face, couldn't deal with it. This one is big and it has a big thick foam thing which offsets that thing off your face. Now you can breathe, it's not fogging up. Before you go to the airport and try to board that flight, you go to Walmart, Dollar General, Dollar Tree, wherever the hell you're going to go, and you get the biggest face shield with the fattest uh, headband you can find, and you'll be able to tolerate it. If you get a tiny one, you're not going to tolerate that for a 14-hour flight, the whole process in Manila, the whole taxi ride. You've been warned about that. You know, don't just try it on in the store and say, oh, this will work. You're going to wear that bitch for 17, 18 hours straight. And then every time you're, you're rolling around in public transit in the Philippines. I can't stress that shit enough. Um, back to the check-in. As I'm checking in, I hear this girl saying, you know, I have to get home. My mother's 86 years old and she's sick. I have to get home, please, please. I checked the website many times. I didn't read that, please. Folks, apparently she didn't have her documents together or did not have a visa. I have no idea her whole story. The point of that is make sure you have your shit together or you will be devastated like that young lady was. Hopefully she was from LA and she could just drive home. But. She may have been in from damn Boston and took Boston to LA 
and been in that airport like us waiting all day only to find out she got no go getting on the flight. Now she's got to try to get a flight back to Boston. Have your shit together. I mean, have your shit together. That's why I'm doing this video for you. Don't just say, oh, well, Marco said that's all they checked. I'm just telling you my experience. But if that girl two doors down told you hers, it's probably totally different. So have all your fucking documents together, people. Please. Went through security in about two minutes. Shout out to the TSA folks working at Tom Bradley International Terminal at LAX. My goodness. Even if there wasn't a lockdown, you guys had that shit so efficient. Like just the way they had the stuff set up. Like I felt like I was initially getting herded like cattle. You know, separating the, the, the calves from the cows. But they were just pushing you down which chute. I went straight through there. Even if... Uh, and I guess it, it's probably because they are so busy, you know, during the normal times. They just had an efficient flow, very friendly. No, I mean, nothing to complain about. TSA at Tom Bradley International Terminal. Shout out to you guys. And as I said on that video, if every security screening was that pleasant, um, nobody would ever complain about going through security screening. So in through there, when you get into the terminal, the only food option I saw open was Panda Express. Now there was a Starbucks open and there was a wine bar, I think serving wine and beer. But food on that side is limited. And there was no food options on the ticket counter side at Tom Bradley. There's a convenience store, but I didn't see any food options. So once you get through, all of the duty free stores are closed. So if you think you're gonna buy booze and cigars and and those chocolates at duty free the duty freeze are closed there are several little stores and the farthest one from my gate i was actually i found some t-shirts for like 4.99 on clearance that said los angeles they were good quality i ended up picking those up for the ladies for a little bit of pasalubon but i intended on getting some chocolates and some cigars you know no the duty free stores are closed at least they were during uh my flight Okay. Um, on the flight, make sure you bring some extra face masks. Okay, why? Because I actually dozed off for about 30 minutes and I must have been just crashed so hard when I woke up I drooled all over my damn face mask. That thing was soaking wet. I must have been drooling <laughs> I must have been drooling the whole damn time dreaming about a fucking steak. That mask was soaked. And so imagine a soaked mask with your saliva and it smelled like, you know, smelled like a damn wet dog. Luckily, I had extra face mask, scrap that one, get a new one, put it on. But if you get on that flight with one face mask, uh, now the cabin crew's got some, so I, obviously you could get one, extra one from them, but just bring you a couple in case you fall asleep and drool all over your damn mask. Okay, have a backup. Uh, once we got airborne, they're gonna hand you a stack of paperwork that I mean, there's probably about eight documents. The print is about that tiny. Folks, if, if I didn't have my, my newfound reading glasses, courtesy of my mom's, thanks mom for buying them damn $1 reading glasses. If you don't have reading glasses, you can't read that shit. And there is a stack of paperwork to fill out. It will literally take you 30 minutes of filling out papers. It's not just an arrival card, it is a stack. Reading glasses, and a, uh, a good pen and some patience to fill that crap out. Okay. I would pack very light for my carry-on. Okay, because when we arrived in Manila, well, this will make sense as I told the story. You get to Manila, plane pulls up to the gate, Coast Guard personnel, medical personnel board the flight. They're gonna give you a briefing about what's coming up and they're gonna take everybody's temperature not with them little bullshit guns. I mean, this girl's holding a, a you know, however much it is, $20,000, $25,000 state-of-the-art temp gun. Okay, so there ain't no there ain't no mistake. If you got a fucking temperature, they're going to detect it. It's not like one of these little bullshit uh, drugstore specials that you see out here in the checkpoints. So uh, they check, take everybody's temp. And luckily, nobody had a temperature, so we were free to the plane and 
as I was deplaning, that's when the when the girl gave me the face mask, and I was kind of a jerk about it because I thought she was going to give me another one of these tiny things. It was just I couldn't fit it around my head. Um, and the girl's like, "Sir, just wear the face mask." I'm like, "All right." So I tried it on, and boom, you know, I felt like an ass because she had given me one appropriate, big enough to fit my big melon head. So shout out to you, girl. You know. Sincerely apologize for, for giving you some riff, but I had a face mask. It was too tiny, but you saved the day, and I'm, I've kept that, and I'll wear that the whole time I'm here. So thank you very much, and again, apology, but, I mean, come on, you understand. When people get off of 14-hour flights, they're not the most jovial. Um, first station, payment booth for the COVID test. When you get in there, they're going to shuffle you into some chairs. Get on your phone. Pull up that QR code and hold your phone up because half the people in there haven't done it or they can't find their QR code. They don't have the paperwork. So they're sitting there filling this crap out. So they're not going to go. They can't go by the line because some people have it and some people don't. I got shuffled in the very last row, but I'm holding up my phone shows the QR code and they told me to come on down because all these other people haven't even got their shit filled out because they weren't prepared. So if you're prepared and they put you in the back, just kind of casually hold it up and say, hey man, I'm ready. Cool, yeah, here's my QR code right here. Is this the right code? And then they're gonna tell you, all right, come on down because all other 20 people are still filling their shit out. You go on down, sit down. All they do is through the glass is scan it. Are you Mr. Blackard? Yes. Is this your email address? And they read it off because that email is how you are going to receive your results. If you give them the wrong email address, if it's off by one letter, you're screwed, okay? And they know this. So pay attention, when you sit down and they scan that code, it's gonna pull up all that information that you entered. But that gentleman read it off to me, sir, is this the email address? Blah, 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 character by character, listen, and make sure 100% they've got that right email address or you're fucked. You're gonna be sitting at that quarantine hotel till the end of fucking time. Pay attention. Make sure you input it right and when that gentleman or that young lady reads it to you, listen, yes, that's good. Okay, sir, it's uh, either 4,500 pesos, you can pay cash, US dollars, Philippine pesos, or you can pay credit card. I said, well, how much is it uh, in U.S. dollars, my friend? He said, in U.S. dollars, it's 94, but you'll receive 300 pesos back for change. No problem. Here's a $100 bill. Gives me 300 pesos back. Perfect. Uh, there's just some tip money, okay? Um, but they do take credit cards, and so no problem there. You're going to pay. You're going to do... Shuffle to the next station, which is the actual swab test itself. You're just going to sit. Oh, now, when, when you pay the money, they're going to give you three stickers, three little stickers and a receipt. So when you go to that, that testing booth, that swab, you're going to hand her those three little stickers. And she's going to tell you, take your mask off, tilt your face shield back, open your mouth and say, ah, ah. That chick went to swab in the back of my throat and it'll almost make you gag. They're not playing around. I mean, they got a job to do. Their technique is to go deep. She's got that damn long ass Q-tip back there and I'm doing everything I can not to fucking gag and puke everywhere. That brings up a point. On the flight, they're gonna feed you twice. The first meal I had, absolutely delicious. Shout out to uh, the folks at LAX putting those meals together. Good food. For airline food, that was a damn good meal. They came around with the second meal and I declined it because I, was, I wasn't hungry and I just kicked back. I'm glad I didn't eat that second meal because if I had ate that second meal, I would have been so damn full. You know, I'd have been full and bloated and here she is sticking that thing in the back of my throat. It probably would have puked all over her damn screen right there. So I was very glad I didn't eat that second meal. So after that, after almost gagging me, she goes in the, in the left nostril and folks, I, I saw them doing it to some people. I was like, holy fuck. I mean, they were taking, I mean, say this damn camera thing. <laughs> I mean, they were going like, I shouldn't hold that up. Looks like a fucking dildo. 
folks, they they were going that deep in people's nostrils. With I mean, it was like, where the fuck is that swab going? And she did the same shit to me. Went so far back that I, I mean, it was all I could do to tolerate it. And my eyes just started crying. My nose started running. I mean, it just put me in a discombobulated state. It was so unpleasant and uncomfortable. Uh, I don't think that it really hurt. It's just uncomfortable. And then when she did the right one, I mean, just instinctively, she went so deep. I just kind of held my head back, and she just grabbed the back of my head, like fucking manhandled me and got the job done. But as soon as, as, soon as she was done, my whole face was just pouring tears, you know, like I was at a funeral. And they just hand you a box up, and you just pull out some Kleenex, you know, and you're going to need it. So I guess what that said, to be prepared, I'd have a, some, some of my own tissues or a handkerchief or something uh, because, you know, they're trying to get this done rapidly. So she's like, here, take two tissues, and I'm just still trying to get my wit together. So if I had it to do over, I'd have me a, my travel scarf around my neck so when, I, when I'm sitting there pouring all that shit, I can wipe my face off and, and, you know, help you if they run out of Kleenex because you're going to need it after that test. It is not pleasant. My friends have said that uh, it caused them nosebleeds. Their, their nose was bleeding for, you know, 10 minutes after those tests. I didn't get a nosebleed, but I did. It, it was like somebody slapped me in the face with a damn wet sponge. So you've been warned about that. Okay, so after that, then you, they're going to, you know, like three or four of us gathered. Okay, follow me. We were, went around the immigration. There was only two people in front of me. It's not a long time to wait. I ended up in front of a, 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 a young lady. She went through, you know, I handed her my passport and she said, okay, where's your DFA letter? And I just handed her my stack of all my documents. And I said, uh, man, well, I, I have, what, what do you mean a DFA letter? I said, that's the first I've heard of anything like that. She said, you're supposed to have a DFA letter, you know, Department of Foreign Affairs. And I said, ma'am, nowhere in the email stream from uh, Washington, D.C., the embassy, nobody, you know, said anything about a DFA letter. The airline never told me about it. The website, um, I, you know, I apologize, but I have no idea, you know, what you're referring to. Yeah, you know, I said, I've got all supporting documents in the packet, but I don't have a DFA letter. Well, you're supposed to have a DFA letter. So apparently it's serious enough where she got up went to the supervisor's office it clearly says supervisors and i'm like man here we go all this work come all this way just got the swab test and i'm going to get no code in immigration because i don't have a dfa letter and not even the embassy told me about a dfa letter the kuya comes out you know older gentleman the big boss he flips through the paperwork and you know i just explained to him i said sir i i didn't know about the dfa letter the embassy never told me about it um, there's my son's birth certificate. I've got a picture of him here in the Philippines. Um, he basically thumbed through it. And he's like, all right, let him go. So nothing against the young lady in the booth. She's doing her job based off of what she's told to do. But in my situation, the big boss came out, applied logic, stamped me in, let me go. Thank you very much to immigration for, for doing that. Because again, it's up to their discretion, folks. One little stamp and boom, your ass is in purgatory. Go back to your own home country. They have that power. And some of you have emailed me and said, hey, my buddy got off the plane, didn't have his visa, and they, they uh, offloaded him. They sent him back. Um, so they certainly have that discretion. So thank you very much to, to the young lady and to the boss man for letting me go. And... Um, I'm putting the information out there so hopefully other people will know to get that DFA letter. I still have no idea what it is, my friends. I'll have to Google it and try to figure it out. Uh, but that's the first I heard of it when I was standing there in front of immigration in Manila Airport. They let me go, and at that point, there's several stations between immigration and baggage claim. You're going to go to a booth and show that two nights booking. They're going to verify that booking. Uh, and I assume if you don't have it, they're going to make you book something right there off the list. I already had it. I showed it to her. 
At this point, they put a sales pitch on me. They said, hey, we've, uh, we've arranged uh, a safe shuttle for, to, to get to your hotel. It's like 1,300 pesos. I politely declined that offer. I said, ma'am, I'll be taking a, a meter taxi. Thank you. you know. And they're trying to sell you a package there. So just for example, I, okay, so there I went to the next booth. It's a guy verifying your transportation. How are you getting to your hotel, sir? I'm taking a taxi. He writes you out a receipt. It's 330 pesos. Go to Bay whatever. Okay, from there you go retrieve your luggage, then clear customs. Uh, go outside of that bay. And it's not actually the meter taxis. It's the same company that Dong works for. It's the SUVs. You hand that, it's 330 pesos, load up, take you to the hotel. Okay, that was my experience coming through Manila Airport the entire time, took about an hour. Is it hectic? Yes. Are you playing musical chairs? Yes. And the, the chairs are kind of close together, that's why I tell you pack lightly on your carry-on luggage. I only had the one bag, but it was too, my little rolling briefcase, my Samsonite, but it was too big they're like rolling between there I had to wrestle it if you just had a small backpack playing musical chairs and going from station to station to station it just makes things easier okay that's just a convenient recommendation um, get to the hotel when you get to the hotel they're gonna take your temperature you're gonna fill out a form you're gonna check in once you check into that room you cannot leave that room they're gonna explain it to you just as Everybody has explained it to you. You're going to stay in the room and you're going to quarantine until your test results come back via email. The hotel will provide you with meals. They'll basically put them on a chair outside your door, knock on the door, walk away. So the door opens, you get the meal. Um, I stayed at the Conrad Manila. I had initially booked that Red Planet. But once I thought, I said, look, I've got to have stuff printed. I need to make sure the internet is good. Um, I, I, I had Hilton points, so that's how I got to that property. But you want to pick a hotel, folks, that the internet is good. They have the capability to print. Okay, uh, You're confident that they're going to bring you some decent food because they told me you can't even order a pizza. You can't order grab food. It's only the hotel food. They won't even let a pizza driver in the building. So I was at the Conrad and the desk clerk told me, he said, sir, you know, I can't guarantee you anything, but most of the flights from PR 103, the test results have been coming back the next day. Okay, thank you. So I'm quarantining in my room. By the time I got to my room, I got a text on the phone that said, you know, check your email. I check my email and it's the company that does the swab. They say, hey, we, we've opened up a case, we've received your, your swab, and we will email you at this address. So everything is good to go. Everything is going my way. Uh, got, got lunch. Hey, baby. Hold on a second, I gotta open the door for Faye, my friends, hold on. Okay, folks, so Faye's here. Um, so anyhow, you know, I had lunch and I'm chilling in the room. Beautiful room. I highly recommend the Conrad Manila for various reasons. But at 4.30 p.m., I had an email that said, here's your test results. And it's a password to file. You open it up. Okay, negative. Good to go. But then what you have to do is you have to click, click that link. It's going to take you over to, I think it's quarantinecertificate.com. It's set up by the Ministry of Quarantine. You're going to fill out a form and you are going to upload your passport. You're going to hit send and it's not going to send you an email. It's not going to allow you to print that certificate. Why? Because you have to email MOQ your test results and make sure you include that password because uh, so, so they can open the document. So when, it, when, the, when the form didn't work, I called the number. The gentleman actually answered the phone. Now, if you've ever done business here in the Philippines with any type of government entity, they never answer the phones. This guy answered on the first ring. I said, sir, I said, I got my negative results, but it won't allow me to print the quarantine certificate. He said, yes, sir, that's because you have to email us the test results and we will manually release it. 
What's the email? Blah, blah, blah. So I email the gentleman. Within one minute, boom, you can print the form. And then they send an email back, hey, just verify that you received it. Yes, I received it. Folks, all the docs connected uh, very easily, but nobody said that I had to do that. I'm just filling out the form, trying to figure out why I want this form, form work. And you start reading and reading and reading and a call, and then it's all quite clear. So I'm telling you what to do. Get your results back, fill out the form. It's not gonna print, but once you fill the form out, then you email them at their email address, and then the guy's gonna manually release it. After that, you're gonna print out the test results and print out that form, and you're free to leave the hotel. The hotel will not allow you to leave unless you have those two documents. Now, if you try to sneak out or whatever, you're, you know, try to pull some shenanigans, number one, you're subject to getting your ass in trouble and arrest, and um, hotel security is not gonna let you leave. You are quarantined until you have those two documents. Then you are free to leave. If you test negative, you're free to leave. If you test positive, what they say is they're gonna come pick you up and take you to the hospital. Now, the reason I recommend a Conrad over some maybe lower budget hotel is this. The Conrad, great internet, the staff are on time. The staff can help you with any problem. They're competent. You're talking about a group of smart folks working there at the Conrad Hotel. Shout out to you guys. They can print your documents. And if you've ever been to hotels in the Philippines, some of these cheaper hotels, half the time the printer doesn't work. It's out of ink. Their internet is down. Folks, you don't want to experience those problems when you're trying to clear uh, this little quarantine process. I highly recommend the Conrad Manila. So when I got those results at 4.30, I emailed them down there and I said, you know what, man? Cancel my, my reservation for tomorrow. I'm out of here. I'm going home. No problem. It was on points. They canceled it. He said, hey, uh, just call Hilton Honors. They'll put the points back on your account. Everything went my way. I called my man Dong. Dong scooped me up. Now make sure you have all those documents ready. Make sure you're wearing your face shield because you're in public transportation, right? We left Manila. We passed a total of four, pa four checkpoints that I saw. The first one had two soldiers there. Um, the, uh, the second one had two soldiers. They never stopped us. The third one, which was near Dinalupihan, they stopped us and asked us where we're going. We said, we're going to Alangapo. He said, okay, but you can't go to Bataan. I don't know why you can't go to Bataan, but the soldier said, you can't go to Bataan. Go that way and you know, go to Alangapo. Okay. Didn't really scrutinize my paperwork too much. I guess he looked in, he saw it was a foreign guy. He knows we're all going to fucking Alangapo, Subic. And so his only objective was don't, you know, don't head towards Bataan. Got it. From there, rolled all the way to uh, Barrio Barreto. Right here at my road sawmill at the Mataan River at the checkpoint there. Now there was only three or four soldiers there, so it's a skeleton crew compared to what I was used to. But boom, get stopped. Where are you going? I was like, man, I just live right up there, you know. I just got in, I've got my quarantine certificate, I have to go home and quarantine for 14 days at this address. And that's what it says. So you want to put your home address on that quarantine certificate because that's where you have to quarantine. So I showed it to him and he's like, you know, well, we got to log you in. So boom, I'm out of the car. I'm in front of the, the sergeant over there and, you know, explain the situation to him. He basically logged me in in the log book and handed my paperwork back. And Dong dropped me off at the house. So here I'm on a self 14 day quarantine at my place of residence. It's on the MOQ certificate. So if any of the local officials come around and want to check me, per the Ministry of Quarantine, I'm where I'm supposed to be and I can't leave this place for 14 days. Now, why do I say that? You guys have emailed me and sent comments. I've seen them fly across that other people here in the Philippines 
have been locked down for visiting other provinces and been quarantined in certain locations. I've heard some horror stories. I don't know if they're true or not. Uh, but I wanted to have my shit together where I don't become a horror story. I don't want to quarantine over at the Brongai building or I don't want to go quarantine at some hospital. I'm following the guidance and the instructions of the Interagency Task Force on Infectious Diseases, uh, the Bureau of Quarantine. Did I say Ministry of Quarantine? I think it's Bureau of Quarantine. I may have misspoke because I don't have my certificate in front of me. I'm following their instructions. So if anybody shows up, I'm not leaving this house because they basically, you know, they tell you, hey, go home. That's where you're supposed to be for 14 days. Don't, don't be rolling around. You're subject to, you know, blah, blah, blah. I don't think that's going to happen, but folks, use it to your, what I'm telling you is use that to your advantage. The law and the guidance says you have to quarantine for 14 days at that address on that document. That's where I'm at. So if anybody shows up, wants to take my temperature, do whatever they want to do, that's fine. But I'm following the guidance of the federal government and I'm where I'm supposed to be. Um, so I think it's important that when you fill out that form, that that quarantine form, make sure it's your home address and not the hotel in Manila. Does that make sense? So you get stopped at any of these checkpoints, boom, that's the address I'm going to. I have to go there. I have to go quarantine for 14 days, guys. And so here I am, folks. So that's how I got from America back to the Philippines during this quarantine. I hope some of that information helps you. Um, Let's see, let me go back over this. You know, keep your paperwork, keep your packet, make multiple copies. I would make multiple copies of that test and the uh, quarantine certificate, those last two things that allows you to leave the hotel. I would make multiple copies just in case somebody at these checkpoints try to take it and say we need it for the law. I would make multiple copies. Um, now look, what if you're flying out from Manila to another place you're flying from Manila to Cebu do your due diligence and your research because I can't speak on that I have no idea it's easy for me because I got in a car my buddy Dong you know who is a legitimate taxi driver and he drove me straight from point A to point B where I'm supposed to be if you're flying out folks I have no idea you know if you're flying from uh, you know if you're trying to go down to Leyte or whatever, you're going to go through so many different local government units. You better do your fucking research because the problems I see and I hear about are not with the federal side, not at the airport. They have a system. No matter where you're coming at from the globe, you're following the system. But there are over 7,107 islands in this archipelago in this country. And every place does things differently. So my... If I were trying to go to, uh, say, from Manila Airport to Cebu to her village, I would say that would be the difficult part of the journey in my mind because now I'm dealing with local, local government units all the way up to her village. When I get to the village, they're not used to a foreigner popping in there. What are they going to do? Um, I'm here in Subic where they're used to the foreigners uh, coming and going, so it's not an anomaly. But if you're trying to go to your wife's village in uh, the backwoods of Leyte, you better do some research and make sure you know what you're getting into, okay? You don't want to get quarantined, you know, in Ormoc for some reason and can't leave for 14 days and your village is right down the road. Okay, so I talked about all that. Recommendations. Choose a decent hotel. I just told you my stay was at the Conrad Manila. Uh, yeah, you can get a cheaper place, but here's why you don't want to. You need good internet and you need it to be in good working order. Cheap hotels usually equal cheap internet. You're waiting on those results via that email address, okay? Bureau of Quarantine, you're going to have to email them back and forth and maybe even make a few calls. You need communications. Make sure you got some load on that cell phone. Okay, number two, you need to print documents. Cheap hotels often have printers that don't work or they're out of ink. 
You don't want to hear that bullshit excuse when you can't leave the fucking hotel to go somewhere else to print it. You gotta have those documents before you leave the hotel. You Conrad over at Mall of Asia, they got a printer and that some bitch works, I promise you. Number three, you have to eat. You can only eat what the hotel brings to your room. You can't order pizza or takeout. So if you stay at a cheap ass hotel, you're gonna get cheap ass food. The food at the Conrad was on time. Shout out to the cook. Number four, why you don't want to choose a cheap hotel. If you test positive for the Rona, for the SARS coronavirus 2, for COVID-19, they say you will be transferred to a hospital for treatment for an indeterminate amount of time. Okay, do you want to drag all your luggage to the hospital? You know, they're going to be taking you in and out of rooms. I don't know, the every hospital I've ever been to, you know, maybe not right now, but it's usually crowded. There's a, it's not a five-star hotel. Do you really want to be dragging all this luggage around if you do get transferred to a, to a hospital? No, you don't. You want to be able to secure that luggage at the hotel that you're quarantined in. So that was my plan. If I popped hot for some reason, came back positive, I was gonna leave all of my gear at the Conrad in their luggage room. You know why? Because I trust them. It's a Hilton property, no problems. And I was gonna roll to the hospital with nothing but my wallet and my passport. And they can quarantine me for however long they wanna quarantine me. All of my sensitive documents are in my pocket. All of my gear is back at the Conrad, secure. I'm not worried about all my gear, okay? And once they let me out of the hospital, I just go back to Conrad, retrieve my gear. Pretty simple, right? Uh, I told you about purchasing a comfortable face shield. The bigger the better. You're going to be wearing that damn thing for hours. Pack the least amount of carry-on because you tight quarters in the chairs, doing the musical chairs um, there when you get to Manila. Tell them you want to take a meter taxi, cost me 330 pesos, and the people at the hotel booth told me it was going to cost me 1,300 something pesos. Uh, make sure you got your reading glasses and an ink pen. You're going to fill out a ton of forms and that print is about that small. Uh, maybe don't eat the last meal they serve on the flight because they're going to stick that damn thing in the back of your throat and you don't want to be so full that you puke. Okay, frequently asked question. Did I have to take a COVID-19 test before the flight? No. That's my personal experience. By the time you listen to my voice, they may have changed it. When I left the Philippines, no. I did not have to take a COVID test to get on that Etihad flight to leave the Philippines. PR-103, did I have to take a COVID test prior to boarding that flight? No. I'm not saying don't go get one. It's better to have one and have that paperwork and not need it. So if I had to recommend something, go pay 100 bucks in the States, get your COVID test. A, you know you don't have it. B, you know you're not gonna get quarantined in a Philippine hospital when you get here because they're gonna test you too. Number three, if they ask for it, you got it. I didn't do it, but that was a, probably a bad thing to do. But no. They did not require the test prior to getting on the flight in my situation. All right, I gotta say thanks. Now folks, if you know me, this is, this, is, this, is, this is hard for me to say, but I'm the type of person that if somebody helps me, uh, whether they're friend or foe, you gotta give credit where credit's due. You know, I'm a, I'm a less government type of guy. Um, so for me to thank any government, there's got to be some real logic to it. I got to thank the Philippines Interagency Task Force on Infectious Diseases and President Duterte for passing and approving resolution number 60. Okay, that resolution has allowed me to return to my family here in the Philippines. And for that, I must say thank you. Um, That resolution, I think, was born out of logic and compassion. Hey, it's not time to let the tourists come back in. Uh, but you know what? 
we need to let these fathers and these mothers and, and these family members get back together. And the Philippine culture is about, you know, family unity. So whoever brought that up or pushed that through, um, thank you very much. Because that could easily have not been changed and I'm still sitting over in America trying to figure out when I can get back to my family, along with all the other foreign parents um, and foreign spouses. So thank you very much for allowing me to return to my family. Other countries around the world uh, are still absolute lockdown. They don't have that stipulation in place, but fortunately uh, for me, you guys changed that and have, have allowed me to come back to my family thanks to resolution number 60. So thanks to the government, everybody who made that happen for us. Um, thank you. Now, with that said, I do hope that the, you know things open up more because the economy certainly needs it. Um, but again, wait, what else can I say, folks? I'm so glad to be back here with, you know, seeing Forrest G and the old lady and my crew and after 14 days of quarantining I'm going to see my daughter and that one little paragraph in resolution 60 could easily not be there and I'd be sitting my ass over in the states just you know missing my babies um, and you know I'm in the entertainment business so let me let me let me jab at the haters and the trolls and all you sad souls out there who, uh, when I went to America, you know, everybody said, oh, you're abandoning your child, you're, you're abandoning, abandoning your wife and your children, your babies in the Philippines during a pandemic, blah, 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 blah. Folks, I understand if you've never traveled before, you don't own a passport, Traveling to another country to you is just so far, so far-fetched. It's so far-fetched of an idea that you can't grasp how people like me, world travelers and expats, we just globe trot around the world like it's nothing. I understand that. So when I say I left and you know left the Philippines to come back to America, that's devastating in your mind because you don't look at things the same as a world traveler or an expat or you know a military person or a flight crew people who travel the world frequently um, to me there's no difference than taking a flight from Atlanta to LA or LA to Manila the only difference for me is is time you know, the flight from Atlanta to L.A. is, what, four, four and a half hours? The flight from L.A. to Manila is 14 hours. That's the only difference that we look at things, right, in our minds. It's just how long is the flight. It's not where we're going. We do this shit all the time. So I understand how some of you can say, oh, I abandoned my wife and kids. Because your mind is so small when it comes to to things like that. That's how you perceive it. Um, but with that said, you know, I still gotta poke you. I gotta you I gotta poke you back a little back a little bit for the entertainment value of it. I'm back, motherfuckers. I'm back at the penthouse suite. I'm gonna be on this balcony barbecuing, listening to music, hanging out with the ladies and my babies. I'm fucking back like a bad motherfucking dream. Like a bad fucking dream. I didn't abandon nobody. You know, you gotta be one sick bastard and one fucking monster to abandon your, your, your children. Um, so all your predictions, all your psychic predictions that I'd never make it back, that I abandon my wife and kids. <sighs> Folks, maybe, maybe one day you'll find happiness in your life and until then, I'm here for you to talk trash about and spew your negativity and make yourself feel better. You know, in the hopes that one day, one day your life improves. So thanks for being a faithful fan. Folks, I hope this video helped you. Again, the, the blog post 
is down in the description, the link. One of your go-to sources of information for me is Philippine Airlines, that page. They update it frequently, keep an eye on that. Email the, email the embassy direct in Washington, D.C., their visa unit. Their email address is on that Philippine Airlines page. I'm not going to put it on here because maybe it changes or what have you. Um, email the embassy. Talk direct to the embassy in D.C. about what you need for your visa. Keep an eye on Philippine Airlines. And it doesn't hurt to call the damn ticket counter because they are the initial gatekeepers of whether or not you're, getting, you're putting your ass on that plane and going wheels up across the Pacific, Pacific Ocean, passing over Hawaii and getting back here. Um, folks, do your own research. But hey, bottom right hand corner of your screen, if this video helped you, hit the subscribe button, click that bell. Give us a, uh, always forget to ask for the thumbs up. I guess that helps too. Give us a thumbs up on the video. And again, this is by no means inclusive and I don't guarantee anything and things change. But if you got kids or a wife over here, where there's a will, there's a way. And the government has allowed us to come back if you just follow their regulations. I'm living proof. I'm sitting here. So it's time for me to get off here, go see what phase cooking up in the kitchen, 4th G still sleeping. Man, that dude, uh, he stays up late now and he gets up late. When I left, he was getting up early, you know, and going to bed early, he's changed his schedule. So I gotta go drag that dude out of bed and check on him, get his day started. All right, folks, thanks for joining me on this video. I'll see you guys on the next one. Peace out and good luck to you if you're, if you're uh, got wife and kids getting back over here. And I'll see you guys around. Peace out.